So today I thought I'd show you some plants I'm pretty enamored with down here in Appalachia, the evergreens. It's a mixture of species from trees to uh, herbaceous forbs and even some ferns and mosses mixed in, but I'm enamored with them because they're hardy. You know, holding on to sensitive plant tissues throughout the winter months is uh, risky. I mean, it's definitely a much more mild winter down here than I'm used to farther north, but nonetheless, you still get plenty of cold nights below freezing, uh, so let's go meet some. Alright, so here's first one personal favorite of mine, the American Holly. And uh, yeah, even though they're really spiky and not fun to camp underneath, at least not to pitch a tent, uh, this is such a cool tree. It's really shade tolerant, so it tends to grow in the understory of pretty dense forests. It's got really thick waxy leaves and the uh, spines on the edge make them not too great for herbivores so they're generally unscathed for the most part except here you can see some leaf mining and herbivory nonetheless doing just fine. What's cool too is some yellow-bellied sapsucker wells. It's a woodpecker that makes these little wells in the tree and then they drip sugars, sugary sap, and the bird comes and laps it up. But one of the coolest aspects of American Holly is just how smooth its bark is. And the bark is home to incredible lichen and liverwort and moss communities like we see here. I'm not sure what most of these are, but I see them on most barks of uh, holly down in this neck of the woods. Alright, we got our first orchid on the list. Right here is the little downy rattlesnake plantain, Goodyear pubescens. I've seen this one in other videos, but it goes without saying, those leaves are my favorite part. Look at that veining. And I'm not sure what the cause of that coloration is, although I do think, in terms of like physiologically, it's spaces in between the cells of the leaf. So it's actual air pockets causing that silvery coloration, but I remember reading somewhere that this could be an adaptation for the low light levels. You know, this is an evergreen tree, uh, orchid growing a dense understory of a forest here, and it could be that those channels help pick up extra light, whatever filters down through the canopy above. I'll have to look into that more though. But can you understand why this orchid's a favorite? It's so beautiful! Right here is our second orchid, believe it or not. This is a single leaf of a cranefly orchid. And check out the underside. Not all of them are this purple. In fact, I'm seeing a lot of variation while I'm down here, but there's some debate as to whether or not that color helps increase the amount of sunlight that, again, this plant can get in this dense understory, or that it helps protect it against too much light when really intense sun flex come through. I don't know if anyone's come up with a satisfying answer, or at least data to support one hypothesis over the other. But the cool thing about this orchid is not only is it out evergreen this time of year, uh, it's extremely variable, and we'll see some other leaves in a little bit here. All right, here's another patch of crane flies. Now, look how prominent those veins are, and sometimes you'll even get like bumps or tubercles on the leaf. Let's turn it over and see, not as purple on the underside. Now, amazingly, these leaves were grown in fall. They did not have leaves all summer. In fact, when this plant flowers, it's only a single brownish purple flowering stalk. Easy to miss if you're not looking for it, but come fall it'll start to grow this leaf. And that seems like a weird time to grow a leaf, especially when winter's coming, but these plants can photosynthesize at extremely low temperatures. And the thought is, is that by growing leaves in the fall, they wait until the canopy above has dropped all of its leaves, and that way they're growing in a much higher sunlight environment than they would be throughout most of the growing season. And so by being hardy and being able to photosynthesize, uh, at really low temperatures, this plant has got uh, sort of cornered the uh, sunlight market for this time of year. Now, come, I don't know, June-ish, this leaf will rot away, and that means it will go into uh, flowering stage. But one of the most important things to remember with orchids like this is that they need rotting wood. The fungus that they partner with that helps fuel their growth and keep them alive throughout their life cycle feeds on rotting wood. And so without a lot of rotting wood in the soil, the fungus can't grow and the orchid can't germinate and grow. So that's why it's really good to not clear out the understory of forests. Let wood decay. Dying trees, snags, all of that dead wood is super important for orchids like this. Wow, I told you they were variable. Here's more crane fly leaves. 
And check those out. So those are the tubercles I was talking about, also the prominent veins. But this whole leaf is purple. Amazing. Not sure if I'm seeing a pattern here, although this one does seem a little bit more exposed than some of the green ones I've been seeing, but I don't know. If anyone knows, comment down below. Let me know what, if anything, has been done to kind of look at the variability among the leaves of the species. And here's one of those evergreen ferns that I mentioned. This is the timely named Christmas fern, considering the time of year it's around, and I think that is not only because it's a common decoration in holiday wreaths, but each one of these pinnae, I guess, looks like a little Christmas stocking if you're into that sort of thing. Regardless, it's evergreen. It will grow new leaves as soon as spring comes around, but by having leaves out and about right now, you know, mild days like this, it got up to about 50 degrees today, uh, probably could switch on photosynthesis and gain a little bit of sugars, but also uh, come spring when everything else is just starting to grow its leaves, this is already having them deployed and can get a jump start on growth. And when you find patches of this, oftentimes it's everywhere. So it's a very successful strategy. Also, like the holly, we saw very waxy leaves and not a lot of evidence of herbivory. I think a lot of ferns are pretty toxic though. So yeah, great strategy, great fern. Here is the evergreen of my youth, Eastern Hemlock. And this one's just holding on, but unfortunately most of them down here have been wiped out and killed by the hemlock woolly adelgid. I'll post a link to the podcast episode I have on that, but uh, if you look underneath the leaves, see those woolly things? This is not that bad of an infestation. Um, but this woolly stuff is an insect, a little adelgid that sits at the base of the needles, taps in with its little proboscis, and just sucks the plant of all of its sugars and carbohydrates that it makes during photosynthesis, essentially starving it to death was introduced it's not a native insect and uh, it is pretty much wiped out most of the hemlock population uh, in the southern United States and it's moving north and I'm sure climate change is only going to make that worse because cold winters actually knock this insect out here's one of the icons of southern Appalachian forests the mountain laurel nice waxy member of the Heath family so it's a not too distant cousin of the rhododendrons and azaleas but it's evergreen, and it is absolutely jaw-droppingly gorgeous when it does decide to bloom in the summer. All right, another fantastic, albeit herbaceous member of the Heath family, Ericaceae. I believe the common name for this is striped or spotted winter green. Regardless, gorgeous plant, very fascinating. Gets these really cool roots that I partner up with fungus and uh, helps it make a living in the dense shaded understory of southern Appalachian forests, likes acidic soils, has really, really cool flowers. In fact, you can see a nice population of this in our Appalachia documentary on this page. So go check that out. But evergreen, gorgeous member of the understory. This is a cool find. I haven't seen this species in a while. This is actually Hepatica nobilis, not a cutiloba. Notice how blunt the little lobes are on those leaves. But a great evergreen species. Again, a lot of people think of this as a spring ephemeral because it's one, if not the first flower to bloom in many areas in the east. But whereas the flowers themselves are uh, ephemeral, the leaves are evergreen and stick around. And look at the modeling on these. This is another species with a ton of variability in color, which, you know, can sit and hypothesize Maybe they're all kind of related to the same sort of feature, or maybe they're not. Maybe it's different uh, selective pressures. Personally, I would bank on something to do with the light environment, but look at that beautiful, beautiful plant. To me, Southern Appalachia is synonymous with this species. This is Rhododendron maximum, or maxima? I don't know, I'll put it down below, but they call it the Rose Bay Rhododendron. It is everywhere, and it's actually increased a lot in many areas, especially riparian zones, due to the loss of the hemlock. It's filled in the understory, and there's a lot of work being done to understand how that's changing. Things like soil chemistry and soil nutrients and carbon sequestration, all that fun stuff. Uh, beautiful member of the Heath family, nonetheless. And uh, fun fact, this species produces pretty toxic nectar. In fact, if you were to eat honey, uh, from bees that were nectared on nothing but rhododendron, you would have severe neurological issues and potentially even die. They call it mad honey. I'll put a link 
in the show notes for this uh, episode that talks about toxic nectar in that context. So this mass of vegetation here is dog hobble. It's yet another member of the Heath family, Ericaceae, which has done amazing things in these mountains. But this species gets its name dog hobble because it grows so dense and intertwined. In fact, when these branches hit the ground, they can form roots and it'll just loop, loop, loop like that. And uh, any dog that tries to go running through a stand of this will get hobbled. Uh, gets really nice pendulous flowers in the uh, springtime and uh, bees absolutely love it. And as you can see, it's a pretty good plant to have for erosion control because of its dense growth. Great native heath. I think this video deserves a big umbrella shout out to mosses. You now we think of mosses as these delicate little plants living in the understory wherever there's enough moisture to keep them alive, but they're damn hardy. I mean, again, this area gets cold. And here they are, fully green, nice and floofy. A lot of them just dehydrate and roll up until favorable conditions return. Others just kind of don't change at all. And look at the sporophytes coming off of this. No idea what this moss is, sorry. If anyone knows, comment under, uh, under this video in the comments section. Let me know. And here, my friends, is a special guest appearance. I knew we'd run into this because this is one of my study sites, but this is the Oconee Bell, Shortia. Now, it is a Diapensiaceae, which is a really cool family. You should look them up. But it is critically endangered down here, and it's only endemic to nine counties about around this region of southern Appalachia. Most of the population was flooded when a dam was built, and it was thought to be lost. But luckily, some people went in saved a bunch of plants. Uh, since then, other populations have been found in the wild, but uh, it does really well as a transplant, provided you give it some, you know, shaded conditions and a decent amount of soil moisture. But uh, the fact that it's so adaptive to gardening conditions and yet so rare in the wild begs a lot of questions about what limits this species. So that's what I'm trying to understand. But uh, this was a transplant where way out and away from its native range at a much higher elevation than it would normally be growing but you can see it's doing really well here so hopefully in a year or two i could have a lot more information published about uh, the needs and uh, potential future for this species oh boy very exciting look at this population of club moss Hupersia. what a great great genus and evergreen Amazing plants. In fact, you can see the strobili starting to form on them. That's where the spores will come out. But they just sit here in the understory, really unscathed. They don't look tattered at all. You know, every once in a while you'll see some frost damage on specimens uh, that are super exposed, but not these. Gorgeous plants.